My name is Dr. David Lynch Solomon, and I'm a perinatologist with Minnesota Perinatal Physicians, or MPP. We specialize in caring for women with high risk pregnancies. Uh, MPP is one of the largest perinatal groups in the upper Midwest. Uh, we are also part of Alina Health, which provides uh, care for families and communities in Minnesota and western Wisconsin. Today's discussion is about uh, ice immunization in pregnancy. So the way that mom can be exposed to uh, blood for which she may become sensitized, there's a variety of ways. One is if she gets a transfusion with blood that is not compatible with her. The other is if uh, fetal blood enters into her system. Now, there's a certain amount of fetal blood that enters the system in any pregnancy, about 0.1 cc's, but there are uh, times when there can be an increased risk of, of fetal maternal bleeding uh, with delivery, with cesarean section, with trauma, uh, miscarriages, any procedures such as amniocentesis or CVS, uh, and even uh, other ways such as needle sharing that may result in uh, contamination of maternal blood. It, you need a, as little as 0.5 cc's of, of bleeding to generate maternal antibodies, so it can be very low. The problem is that some women are more reactive than others, so that uh, a certain amount of blood may generate a response in some women, but not others. Okay, so now there are different types of isoimmunization. The one that most people know is RH, RH positive, RH negative. The RH system actually consists of uh, four uh, antigens, uh, D, there's no little d, uh, the C's, the E's, and G. But there are many, many other antibodies that, uh, that can develop in, in pregnant women, at least 38 different groups. Uh, the ones that, only certain of them are, are more significant uh, in terms of causing, uh, potentially causing isomerization uh, in pregnancies. And these are the, obviously big D, small c, big E, Kel, Duffy, some from, some from the MNS group, the P group, and the ABO group. So that, and the reason that miscarriages can potentially generate a response is that there are RH antigens on fetal red cells as early as six to seven weeks of menstrual age. Uh, there are some antibodies that are only IgM in nature and they're too big to cross the placenta. So the Lewis, uh, P1, and the I are not big enough to cross the placenta so they will not affect the fetus. Uh, there is this, uh, the, the reference you see uh, on, on the slide is a book generated by the NIH which shows gene frequencies of all these antigens and it's actually quite fun to look at. I actually have a copy of that that I carry on with me all the time. All right, so we'll talk about RH. Even though RH used to be the most common, it's becoming less and less common because of uh, preventative measures which we'll get to into in a little bit. So as you probably know that, uh, that there, there's a difference in terms of gene frequency with, between various parts of the world with the, the greatest being in, in Basques, which are about a third of, of people of Basque origin uh, have our RH negative. And you can see the, the range uh, all the way down. For those people that don't know where the Basque region is, it's right there, northern Spain, southern France. So historically, the most common uh, type of isomerization uh, was uh, RH. Big D. Uh, Rogam is actually antibody that helps prevent uh, sensitization for mom. So before the use of Rogam, the, the chance for isomerization with any pregnancy is about one in six, about 16%. When Rogam started to be used, it was used postpartum and that prevented, uh, that uh, dropped the level down to about one to two percent. Uh, using it at 28 weeks, then dropped it down to about 0.1 to 0.3%. Here in the US, we give it at 28 weeks. Other countries, they give it 28 and 34 weeks. And essentially what it is, is 300 micrograms uh, of, of antibody. And that covers about 15 cc's of red cells, which is about 30 cc's of whole blood. It lasts about 24 days, but there can be a range in terms of how long it lasts. Some can last much further than that. So uh, uh, to the point that if you get Rogam at 28 weeks, uh, at term, about 15 to 20 percent of women may have uh, a titer of uh, greater or, or less or equal to one to four at term. And you have to understand that even though the RH group consists of uh, D, C, E, and G, it only covers D. Fundamentally, 
what causes isomerization is the antibody. So you have to have enough antibody around that can potentially affect the fetus. And you have to have a fetus that is potentially, can be affected by the antibody. In other words, they will have that antigen. So a lot of times, uh, one of the first things to do these days is to actually check the father, especially for some of the, the, the non-RH blood types, such as Kel. The gene frequency of Kel is, is very low in the population, only about 8% are, are heterozygous. Most people do not possess the Kel antigen. So a lot of times, if, they have the, if, if you know what the antibody is, you can check the father to see what their antigen status is and whether they contain one or two genes of it, whether they're heterozygous or homozygous, and whether they can even pass this along to the fetus. There, you can also check the fetus to see whether or not this, this fetus actually is carrying that particular antigen. Uh, the way that we can do that these days is with cell-free DNA from mom's blood. The same thing that's used for uh, the uh, first trimester uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT. The, although the, the technology exists to be able to do this for Kel and some other antigens, it's not available in the U.S. That's available more in Europe. So the only thing we can treat, uh, check for here in the U.S. is RH. So we can check for that to see whether or not the fetus actually has the, anti, uh, has the antigen. The other way that we can do it is kind of the old-fashioned way is we can always check it out using amniocentesis. Uh, we are not using amniocentesis as, as much as we used to in the past because there are other uh, less invasive ways of figuring out uh, if the fetus is anemic or not. So again, what I tell patients is that the concern about isomerization is it may cause fetal anemia. Now, simplistically, I say, you know, if, if I'm worried that I'm anemic or you're anemic, all I can do is take a little bit of blood and we can figure it out that way. We can certainly do that with the fetus directly by putting a needle into the cord the problem is that's fairly invasive, and most of the time we don't need to do that. So we look for other indirect ways of assessing the likelihood for fetal anemia. And the first one is there has to be enough antibody around. So, so that's why we look at the titers. So if an antibody is identified and then titered, there is a, a level at which that it becomes clinically significant. And that's usually if there's a fourfold rise or if it goes above 1 to 16 or 1 to 32 in terms of dilution. What that means is that if they, they take the blood and they find the antibody, dilute it once, 1 to 2, they still find the antibody, they keep diluting it. The more they dilute it, if they still find antibody, it means there's a lot there. Different labs have a different threshold in terms of what the cutoff is. But it's usually 1 to 16 and 1 to 32. We'll talk about Kel briefly because Kel antibodies have a lower threshold for potential anemia because they not only uh, cause the uh, red cells to be destroyed, but they also affect the production of red cells in the fetal marrow. Uh, another thing that people have sometimes seen is that they sometimes see that there's a tube method and a gel method of figuring out what the, what the, the titer is. Uh, the, the gel method is perhaps more reproducible between labs, but the problem is that it gives a higher titer, maybe one to two dilutions more but sometimes higher than that. So, so you have to, if you're, if you're checking what the titers are, you have to make sure they go to the same lab and they're doing it the same way in order to have consistent. So that what you look for is, you, is, there, is there enough antibody around? So you check it every, every month up to about the third trimester and every couple of weeks after that. And then if, if it's high enough, it crosses that threshold, then in the old days, we used to do amniocentesis to look at uh, the amount of bilirubin in the amniotic fluid. We don't need to do that anymore because there is a better non-invasive way of assessing this, and that's by looking at the mitral cerebral artery peak systolic volume. That's what that MCAPSV means. And we know that by using a cutoff, and there, there, there's, a, there's a nomogram for uh, what, what the normal range is throughout pregnancy, and it changes, so it has to be specific to the gestational age, so that we know that that if it gets above 1.5 MOMs, that, that's a pretty good indication of significant fetal anemia. The, the positive predictive value is fairly high with that, with, with uh, very few false positives. So typically, we'll look at it every one to two weeks. We'll see what the trend looks like. 
But again, it, it's a good predictor. Uh, and we can use that up to 35 weeks. There is really no data after 35 weeks. So this allows us to ask the kid how they're doing on a regular basis to figure out whether or not there's evidence of anemia. And if there isn't, we just leave them alone. This is an ultrasound still image of uh, the assessment of the middle cerebral artery. Uh, and they're very, it's very specific. It has to be as, tri as vertical, vertical as we possibly can get it. Uh, and you, you measure the peak systolic flow. So it's, it's obviously challenging if the baby's moving around. Not all kids are nice and quiet in this particular, uh, in this particular position. So that it, it can be challenging to obtain this, but it's important to obtain it properly because we base a lot of our clinical decision making on this. So, so, the, so the, the uniformity of how we do this is very important and we, st we strive to make sure that that's the case. So we base our clinical practice on this and we do this every single day in our practice. So we've established that the, there's enough antibody around that we'll have to look at the MCAs. Once you start doing MCAs, you don't do any more titers anymore. There's no utility in doing that. Uh, and if we, if we establish the fact that there's a, the MCA is above 1.5 MOMs and it's under 35 weeks, then we consider a fetal transfusion. Uh, most of the time, these kids are anemic. Most of the times we're not going to see fetal hydrops or extra fluid around the baby. Most of the times these kids are moving around quite well, even though they're quite anemic. So that there, certainly there are signs on ultrasound that may tell us what's going on, but for the most part, that's the point. This is the time we need to figure out what the kid's hemoglobin is. Uh, so again, typically depending on gestational age, if it's at a point where the baby is potentially viable, we'll prepare for preterm delivery by giving betamethasone. Uh, we'll have the uh, transfusable blood available. It's typically RH negative, double concentrated, CMV negative, uh, irradiated blood. The reason it's double concentrated is that there, there's a, only a restricted amount of space within the fetal placental unit. So we, we try and give less volume. So that typically we would transfuse, we, once we sample the, uh, the fetus, and again, typically what ends up happening, it's usually done in the OR, usually with local anesthetic, we uh, do this under ultrasound guidance. We put the, the needle in uh, into the cord, uh, and then we give us we take off a sample. We also use some paralytic drug because it, we know that if kids don't move around as much, the chance for a successful transfusion increases. So we do that, and then typically what we'll do is we have uh, people standing by that are uh, available to check what the hemoglobin is, and then we will slowly start a transfusion. Now again, we know there are nomograms that establish the normal hematocrit hemoglobin of a fetus throughout gestation. And that what we try and do is we try and transfuse up to about a hematocrit of 40 to 50. So again, it, it, is, it takes a bit of time to do this so that uh, then we, we get the information back and then uh, once we, there are, uh, there are also calculations that allow us to figure out approximately how much blood to give. It's, it's a ballpark, but we, we give that blood because if we don't want to over-transfuse, we don't want to under-transfuse. We don't want to overload the baby. So we, we put in as much blood as we think needs to go in and then we resample because, we're, again, we're looking for that goal hematic of about 40 or 50 and then, and then we stop. So that at this point, most of the fetal blood is still fetal, although there's some adult Rh negative blood. We'll just use Rh negative blood. Uh, within the fetus. So the, those, those red cells will not be affected by the antibody, but they'll still decay. So there's still fetal uh, cells available that will be affected by the antibody. So there's going to be a decline. The, it, because it's an ongoing problem, there will be a decline in the hematocrit. And it ranges from about 0.2 to 0.4 grams per day. Uh, and and it, it, it becomes less the, the more transfusions you do because there's less and less fetal blood. So uh, there, some people will do the first transfusion uh, and then the second one after 10 days, and then two weeks and three weeks. Th there's various ranges of doing this. There's data to suggest that we can use the MCA PSV after one transfusion, but not more in terms of the predictability that it would tell us the fetus is anemic. Uh, and there are different uh, thresholds at which we would then consider the fetus severely anemic, usually about 1.32. This is, it. this is not as important for ongoing isomerization, but sometimes maybe important for a one-time transfusion, let's say a fetus that's affected by a parvovirus. 
So we will continue doing these transfusions uh, up until about 35 weeks. Typically, once the last transfusion is done, we usually deliver people about three weeks after that. It, it kind of depends. Some of it depends on what we think is the decay of the, of the, uh, uh, the hemoglobin and what it might end up being. We usually like to, the pediatricians tell us they like no lower than seven to eight hemoglobin, so we try and plan for that. With any isomenized pregnancy, uh, whether they, they're, they're just following antibodies or doing PSVs or, uh, or we're looking at, or we're actually doing transfusions, we begin weekly antenatal testing at 32 weeks. Most of the time, we will suggest delivery by 37, 38 weeks. And then again, if there's transfusions, we typically deliver three weeks after the last transfusion. In summary, you need enough antibody uh, to affect a fetus that is susceptible to the antibody uh, in order to create fetal anemia. We indirectly assess that initially with titers and then with uh, looking at the middle cerebral artery peak systolic volume. And occasionally we need to do transfusions. Uh, typically if, if you've had a first effective pregnancy, we sometimes will skip doing the titers and just start using the MCAs. Usually it's earlier with, with uh, uh, Kel as opposed to other uh, antibodies which we'll uh, do a little later. Uh, for the most part, these fetuses are, and newborns are entirely normal. Uh, and a lot of it depends on gestational age at delivery, which for most of these kids is near term. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or would like a perinatologist to come and speak with your group, please call us at 612-863-4502 or find us on alanahealth.org forward slash MN Perinatal. If you would like to refer your patient to MPP, click on the link within the email. It will go directly to our online service request form. Thank you once again for listening to this presentation. We look forward to partnering with you to provide the exceptional personalized care your high-risk pregnancy patients deserve.